All right, well, hello everyone. And um, welcome to Star at Lehigh, the evolution of a neighborhood icon. Um, my name is Michelle Rassiopi. I'm the program and communication manager for Docomomo US. Um, and uh, first of all, we just wanna thank Humanities New York for supporting this through one of their vision grants um, with the support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And um, before we start, I just want to let you know that we're this is uh, being recorded and we are going to post it on YouTube after the presentation. So um, it'll be available there afterwards. And we encourage everyone to say hello in the chat and um, say who you are and where you're from. And throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, um, share them in the chat as well. And afterwards, we'll have a Q&A and um, we'll get to the questions then. Um, so, next slide. Oh, sorry. So I meant to go to this slide when I was talking about Humanities New York. So then we'll go to the next one. Um, and I just wanna start off before we go to the presentation to give you a quick introduction of Docomomo in case you're not familiar. Um, Docomomo US is actually part of a um, international organization called Docomomo International, um, which was started in 1988 and has 71 chapters around the world. Um, and in the United States, um, we were founded in 1995. So actually 25 years ago this year, and we have 18 regional chapters around the country. Um, and, oh, sorry, and we, this is our tagline that we like to say. So we've been doing preservation of mid-century for a long time before there was Mad Men, Design Within Reach or Dwell, there was Docomomo. Um, and in case you are wondering where the name Docomomo comes from, it is an acronym and it stands for the Documentation and Conservation of buildings of the modern movement. And um, our mission is to preserve the modern architecture, landscape, and design of the mid 20th century. Um, through advocacy, education, education, and documentation, we provide leadership and knowledge by demonstrating the importance of modern design principles and including the social context, technical merits, aesthetics, and settings of these important pieces of American history. So um, getting to how we do this work, um, primarily we do this through advocacy and education, which includes outreach and communication efforts, working with our local chapters, supporting of our partners that are also working to save modern sites around the country, and a lot of educational programming, such as our uh, national symposium, the Modernism in America Awards, which are coming up in November, um, international travel tours, and a lot of other really um, fun programs that we do throughout the year. And the reason why we are here today talking about the Star at Lehigh building, um, there are so many amazing modern sites that we could be doing presentations about, but we, our office is based in New York City, and just last year we actually moved to a new office in the Star at Lehigh building. Um, and we knew about it beforehand, but we um, when we moved there, we just felt even more in love with it. We learned more about the history and the story behind it. And it was just so cool. We thought it would be great to share the story with a broader audience. So that was sort of the genesis of this whole project. Um, now I'm gonna introduce John and then we can go to the presentation. So um, our tour guide today is John Kriskevich. Um, he's an architectural historian and ho holds an architecture degree from Pratt Institute. He is an associate member of the American Institute of Architects um, and a retired associate adjunct professor at Parsons School of Design, where he taught courses pertaining to architecture and planning history. He has curated design exhibits on architectural history and urban planning and frequently conducts tours. Um, if you've ever been on a New York City architecture boat tour, he may have been your guide. And um, his published writings include art articles in the New York Times, Architectural Record, and Yale School of Architecture's publication constructs. And of course, he has a special affinity for mid-century modern architecture. Um, so without any further uh, ado, 
Um, I will turn it over to John and I hope you all enjoy the presentation. Okay, everybody, hi. And it just wouldn't be a presentation without a little getting things organized. There we go. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the story at Lehigh Building and its evolution as a neighborhood icon. And in order to do that, we uh, are going to look at seven subsections uh, breaking, breaking the, this vast building down into seven uh, areas of interest, neighborhood context, historic context, architects, engineers, developers, and builders, style, innovations, space, and adaptive reuse. So first is neighborhood context. And here you see a map. Uh, the neighborhood that we're looking at is called West Chelsea. It's on the Hudson River. It's bounded, sorry. It's bounded by Midtown and uh, what's now Hudson Yards to the north. Uh, the residential district of Chelsea and the Flatiron District to the east and to the south, the Meatpacking District at 14th Street. So we're talking about the area roughly from about uh, 30th Street on the north and uh, 14th Street on the south the Hudson River to the west, and uh, about uh, 10th Avenue, 9th Avenue uh, is as far as we'll go to the east. <clears throat> and you can see on this map, uh, there are three districts. The uh, Chelsea Historic District, uh, which was created uh, several decades ago, uh, the West Chelsea Historic District, which is newer, 2008, and this larger blue area in the middle of that's a special West Chelsea district was a rezoning of the area around the High Line before the High Line was such a success uh, when building owners were not uh, especially keen on the idea. Uh, and uh, this was a way of sweetening the pot. Uh, they were able to uh, move uh, air rights around, and it was a way of protecting light and air. Uh, you'll notice if you walk on the High Line today, the tallest buildings are in the north, and the smaller buildings are in the south. That's part of that special West Chelsea district, though many of us would argue that perhaps they gave away too much uh, zoning bonus. Uh, no one realized how back uh, 20 years ago, how successful a project it would be and how successful this neighborhood would be. But let's go back when life was much simpler. <laughs> Pre-1609, 1609 is the point that most historians agree is the point of contact. When explorer Henry Hudson made contact with the indigenous people of the island of Manhattan, the Lenape. There may have been contacts before, but this is the one that is uh, confirmed that we have a written record of it. And it's Henry Hudson's exploration that leads to the claiming of the entire Lenape lands uh, by the uh, Dutch. And uh, this illustration is courtesy uh, of the book Manhattan. And it's a computer generated uh, image that's uh, taken from uh, eyewitness accounts that have been written down and maps. 
but you can see things changed once the Europeans came and the English are replaced by the Dutch, and then uh, the Americans uh, claim their independence. And uh, New York is a sleepy town in a way. Uh, it doesn't extend much uh, further north than uh, Canal Street at the early part of the 19th century. Uh, but uh, you can see that it has a very organic street plan down there uh, that dates from uh, 17th century Dutch colonial period with additions in a rather haphazard way. And uh, in order to deal with further growth, that's a familiar story to all of you, the 1811 Commissioner's Plan creates 12 broad avenues that run north-south and 155 streets that run east, west, river to river. It doesn't specify where anything is going to be, doesn't take into account existing property lines or topography. Uh, it's a perfect vehicle for real estate speculation. And that's what it's all about. So if you bemoan high rents and gentrification and all of those things that we're constantly reading about and discussing, it's always been like that one way or the other, except before 1609. Uh, you can see the shorelines are very irregular, and uh, those crooked lines that you see are existing trails. Uh, it's a paper plan. None of the streets that are dark, uh, the ones that are dark are built up, and the rest is not. The man that knew Manhattan best is uh, Egbert Veal. Uh, he was a quite an accomplished gentleman, as you can see. Cartographer, surveyor, civil engineer. This is uh, known as the Veal map. Its official name is the Sanitary and Topographical Map of the City and Island of New York. And this uh, gentleman, Mr. Veal, tramped across every square yard of Manhattan Island, and he had the dog bites to prove it because farmers did not want him surveying in northern Manhattan. And when I say northern Manhattan, I, it's like north of 23rd Street at the time. Uh, all of the topography is accurate. All of the watercourses are accurate. So accurate, accurate in fact, that contractors today use this uh, 1865 map to um, do their estimates to see how uh, problematic a foundation will be if there'll be uh, leaks from uh, underground streams and there'll be uh, problematic footings and things like that. So it's really important. Uh, if it were left to veal, he probably would not have created streets that were straight that don't pay attention to hills or valleys or watercourses or swamps or rocky outcroppings. Uh, but he uh, had a job to do and he did it. And we thank him for it. Uh, just to go back for a moment. The area that we're talking about today is this area. And you can see that it has been filled in by the 1860s. So this is the original shoreline, which would be somewhere between 9th and 10th Avenue. And this is bringing you to present day 12th Avenue, that seawall, that's where the park is, is that. Here's a uh, a more graphic example of the change from the pre-1609 island to uh, the present day. And uh, the uh, graph that you see on the right, I just discovered, it shows the change in elevation that was man-made changes in elevation. So we think that, we often think that Manhattan was leveled. Um, anybody that's walked or had to, or, you know, ridden a bike knows that Manhattan isn't flat, but it's just been smoothed out. The hills were made a little less steep, valleys were filled in, and of course a great deal of the shoreline was filled in. And the reason for that was not so much to make new land, but to allow deeper and deeper ships to be able to dock. And the natural shoreline was either wetlands or beach-like, so by filling in land, yes you got extra land, but you also created a deeper draft for the increasingly deeper ships, especially as the technology changed in the mid-19th century from sailing ships 
to uh, steamships. And uh, the port shifted from the East River, which you see on the right hand of that big image, to the wider, deeper Hudson River on the left side. It also reminds us that uh, we tend to be very, uh, you know, uh, oblivious to the obvious, uh, and we think that our technology will save us. And we were reminded in 2012, a dress rehearsal for what will come with greater frequency. We're told this is the neighborhood that we're talking about in 2012. The water came as far uh, east as uh, 10th Avenue, uh, which is about 4,000, I'm sorry, uh, about 2,000 feet, so about a quarter of a mile in length. By the mid 19th century, uh, the grid had been established in this area, uh, the uh, blocks plotted out, and you can see the grid, the way the, the rationale for the grid was that it provided a very orderly way of land speculation. The blocks are based on a multiple of a 25 by 100 foot block, 25 feet being the um, most economical width to build a row house because that's what you could span with a, a wood joist without a column. And uh, 100 feet gave you room for a, uh, a row house and a backyard where you would have your well and a privy together. Uh, this is the city that the 1811 grid planned for, uh, a city of small red brick federal or Greek revival style row houses. You'll notice the name at the top of this, it says uh, the Clarks and the Moors. Uh, this was the family uh, uh, that uh, gave uh, us the uh, General Theological Seminary that we'll take a look at as well as uh, the famous poem uh, to us the night before Christmas, or at least that's who it's attributed to, Clement Clark Moore. And here's the General Theological Seminary. It gives you a little glimpse into uh, the time period architecturally and spatially. This was probably one of the larger buildings in the residential portion of the area. Now, uh, 9th Avenue is a transition zone. Uh, to the east, it's largely residential. Uh, to the west, it uh, became increasingly commercialized, industrialized, as the waterfront changed from a natural uh, beach and wetlands area to wharves. Uh, London Terrace is an example of the type of uh, comfortable upper middle class uh, row house development uh, that you had in uh, the eastern portions of West Chelsea between 9th and 10th Avenue. This is 23rd Street. And by the way, the wide crosstown streets, there's one every half mile. John Randall, who was the, uh, who was, um, the surveyor for the uh, 1811 grade, was really proud that he got 20 blocks to a mile, north, south, and six blocks east, west along the avenues. Every half mile, he put a wide crosstown street. And originally, these were seen as very desirable for the fanciest uh, houses, the best addresses. But uh, they also were the first to become commercialized, as we'll see. So here we have an early example of uh, the type of uh, warehouse uh, that was being built uh, in the first half of the 19th century. There was a federal law passed in 1848 that uh, was very beneficial to New York that made uh, uh, created what was called a bonded warehouse, which was basically a duty-free zone. So you could store goods from foreign lands in a bonded warehouse without paying uh, duties on them. And uh, this, this saved a lot of money and it made New York uh, much more competitive as a port compared to others. Although New York had a lot of other natural advantages, a deep, wide, sheltered harbor, plus with the building of the Erie Canal, in 1835, uh, you had a direct uh, connection between the Hudson River and the Great Lakes. So you had a direct water route between the Port of New York and the burgeoning Midwest, something the other East Coast ports didn't have. So uh, warehouses like the uh, Baker and Williams 
uh, were built. This is from the 1850s. And uh, I should say it has a very interesting 20th century uh, history, an infamous history. Uh, this was one of uh, several sites in Manhattan where the very aptly named Manhattan Project took place in secret during World War II. And uh, about 219,000 pounds of radioactive uranium was stored there for several years. And uh, in 1989, uh, the federal government began to uh, go back to these sites and found that it was still hot. And uh, there was remediation that took about six years. So think about that when you go past this, it's um, 20, I think it's 25th Street, about just off the High Line, the Baker and Williams Bonded Warehouse. As technology became uh, more advanced, uh, warehouses got bigger and more complex. And in many ways, uh, terminal stores is uh, sets a template for the Storette Lehigh building in that it takes up an entire city block, although it's actually 25 separate buildings. Unlike the, the uh, advanced structural technology that we're gonna be talking about in Storette Lehigh, uh, this uh, is uh, load-bearing masonry and timber, uh, but it's a very handsome uh, building. And uh, you'll notice the central arch. The central arch was designed so that the New York Central freight line, which ran down 10th Avenue, that's what we're looking at now, could uh, turn off 10th Avenue and go directly into the building, two tracks, and then come out the other side, which is uh, uh, the waterfront. Uh, so we're on, excuse me, we're on 11th Avenue and uh, the trains would go right through the building uh, onto the piers. And then uh, since there aren't any bridges or tunnels for freight, uh, between Manhattan Island and the rest of the country, uh, freight cars were put onto barges and floated across the Hudson River. And on the New Jersey side, there were railheads that would allow uh, the various railroads to uh, continue the freight uh, to all points, west and south and north. And remember, it was a highly competitive business railroads in the 19th century, and each one had their own uh, docks and their own rail yards are along the west side. So the west side was a really, really messy, noisy place. The only railroad that had direct access to Manhattan Island was New York Central. They had the freight line down the west side and down the east side, they had Grand Central Depot, which would become the Grand Central Terminal we all know and love. Now, this is our site, but our site uh, just um, maybe about in the 1890s or so. Uh, this is, uh, what you're looking at is the car float that I described, uh, Trans Hudson Rail Freight Car Float. Uh, the Erie is to the north, the Erie uh, Lackawanna Railroad, the Erie Railroad had an open yard. Uh, we see the uh, uh, terminal stores building uh, to the left with, with the big water tank on top. And uh, the pier that says Valley, uh, the, it's Lehigh Valley, the Lehigh Valley Railroad. And in front of that uh, pier with the two uh, pyramidal towers is an open uh, yard for the uh, Lehigh Valley. And that's the site of the present day store at Lehigh building. And then you see another building facing it that's on 11th Avenue. And then to the south, to the right, is the uh, Baltimore and Ohio Railroad yards, the B&O Railroad. And they built, as you can see, a masonry uh, storage facility. So this is the neighborhood context uh, in the 1890s around our site. That's why I keep doing that. Here we go. Uh, the area is starting to get some sophisticated architecture and technology at the beginning of the 20th century, a vast undertaking where the, uh, the uh, uh, Manhattan is cut into instead of being built out to create 
thousand foot long piers for the new class of superliners um, like the, uh, the uh, Mauritania and the Olympia and the Titanic and the Lusitania with their four stacks. And uh, the uh, commission was given to Warren and Wetmore who, were, who was busy at the time designing um, Grand Central Terminal, uh, which was under construction between 1903 and 1913. So uh, Chelsea Piers and uh, Grand Central are contemporaries, and they both served as grand gateways into the city, a city that wasn't grand yet. It was an economic engine, but it was very haphazard, very unplanned. And these uh, Chelsea Piers and Grand Central were all part of the Beaux-Arts City Beautiful movement, this idea of creating a city that was both utilitarian and beautiful and had aspirations of being a world city. I like to call it dress for success architecture. And here you see uh, the steel has now been covered with the same limestone and granite uh, that we have at Grand Central. And uh, you, some of you have taken uh, the AIA boat tours from these piers. Some of you have uh, played sports or swam or eaten at one of the restaurants or maybe watched, uh, if you're not, Athletic, you were home watching TV, watching Law and Order, which are filmed at studios in these buildings. Uh, they're unrecognizable. They were stripped to the steel skeleton in the 1960s, covered in uh, corrugated steel. I'm not sure why. Um, and But uh, they were revived in the 1990s as uh, the Chelsea Pierce Sports and Entertainment Complex. But this is, uh, this is 12th Avenue before the elevated West Side Highway before Westway, before the Hudson River Park. This is 1910. Uh, we also have uh, attracted to the deep water port and uh, the wider deep or Hudson River and its access to the Erie Canal in the Midwest and the New York Central Railroad and all the railroads that flow across the, the river, large scale manufacturing. And this would be one of the nation's largest manufacturers this is the National Biscuit Company complex. Uh, there were some buildings there in the 1890s, and there was a great deal of consolidation during this period. Uh, some people would call it monopolies. Uh, and Nabisco was formed, National Biscuit Company. And uh, they were a worldwide uh, food manufacturer. Uh, they manufactured things like Oreo cookies and their famous You Need a Biscuit. Uh, and uh, shipped around the world. The, the uh, flour and sugar and flavorings would come in by rail. Uh, sugar from the Caribbean would come in by boat. Uh, Madagascar and vanilla, all those other flavors uh, by rail or by ship. And then the manufactured goods would be shipped out by ship or rail. I mean, it couldn't be more convenient. And the complex grew between the 1890s and uh, uh, 1934. Nabisco, uh, as a company, occupied this uh, block-long building from, nine, from 1898 to 1958, when a combination of uh, federal tax law that was designed to, it was a, a Cold War, um, uh, had a Cold War uh, bias to it. Uh, after World War II, there was an attempt to move targets, uh, both uh, civilian and uh, commercial and industrial, out of cities. So uh, you got a, a, a favorable uh, tax uh, uh, deal if you built a new plant in the suburbs but there was no tax advantage to modernize an existing plant in the city. So uh, Nabisco is just an example of what was happening all across New York City and all across the, the Northeast, this deindustrialization. So they moved to Hanover, New Jersey, not too far away, but certainly too far for the people that were living in the tenements and uh, the row houses that by the mid 20th century had been converted from single family homes to uh, flats and rooming houses for an increasingly working class uh, 
population that was working in places like Nabisco. Uh, by the 1920s and 30s, this neighborhood was no longer desirable. But uh, there were developers who had visions that they could change it. Uh, and maybe they were just a few decades too early. Uh, London Terrace was redeveloped as London Terrace. Uh, this time a block long uh, middle class enclave taking the name of the existing row houses, uh, but going one step further to create a sense of place, the doorman dressed as London Bobbies and it had a, 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 a indoor swimming pool and a central landscaped private park. 1700 apartments. It's uh, pretty dense and you can see the newly completed Empire State Building in the background. And you know this is a pre-war photograph because it does not have its television antenna at the top of its mooring mast for dirigibles. So uh, while the Empire State Building is under construction, our site is under construction. Uh, the uh, Sturette uh, and Eakins company, uh, the company that is the uh, the builders of the Empire State Building form a real estate company and uh, they take a 99 year lease on the Lehigh Valley rail yards and they enter into a, a partnership with the Lehigh Valley rail, uh, uh, Railroad, hence the name Sturette Lehigh for this new project. And here we see the uh, neighborhood uh, in this uh, 1920s, 1930s, uh, between the two world wars era. You can see the whole waterfront has been completely built out. There's a continuous line of finger piers from the Battery at Southern Manhattan all the way up to 60th Street. And uh, here we have the uh, Strait Lehigh building plot, the b and uh, you know, uh, railroad warehouse and yards to the south, uh, to the north, uh, the terminal stores, and then north of that, the Erie Railroad yards. And uh, north of that would be the uh, New York Central's 30th Street yards where Hudson Yards is today. The deck uh, over those yards supports those buildings that you know. This is uh, 10, uh, 11th Avenue, and it was known as Death Avenue because sometime in the mid 19th century, the city had allowed the New York Central Railroad a franchise to run their West Side Freight Line down through what was supposed to be Riverside Park, uh, through Northern Manhattan and the Upper West Side from Spite and Dialyville down to their 60th Street rail yards and then uh, through 11th and 10th avenues. I think this is probably going through uh, Hell's, what was, used to be called Hell's Kitchen and North Chelsea. You can see a combination of horse-drawn wagons and uh, the white wings, the guys sweeping, uh, getting rid of the horse manure, the pollution, organic pollution and uh, the rail cars. And uh, I've seen film because this continued as late as the early 30s. And there's film and it's frightening to watch because you know how New Yorkers jaywalk today? That's what they did. There's a freight train coming down 11th Avenue. Oh yeah, I can beat it. And they walk in front of it. Uh, and a lot of them didn't make it, hence the name Death Avenue. Uh, the other issue was as the automobile was increasingly becoming a part of the transportation picture. Uh, traffic was generally uh, at a standstill because you had traffic coming off the piers, uh, loading and unloading, trying to get into the city going east-west. And then you had this traffic artery of West Street and 12th Avenue running north-south. You have horses, you have automobiles, you have new uh, motor trucks. And then you have, if you notice up at the top, a steam train making the turn from 10th to 11th Avenue, not a, good, not a good picture. Something had to be done. This was intolerable. And the something that was done was called the West Side Improvement. 
Now, uh, this is attributed to Robert Moses, but the idea uh, began uh, earlier in the boom of the 20s. Uh, several people suggested it. Uh, the uh, railroad was sometimes for it, sometimes against it, but there was the money to do it in the 20s. Uh, but as the 20s became the 30s and the depression uh, happened, uh, it looked like this wouldn't happen. Uh, and uh, was completed uh, thanks to Moses, so he does get the credit for it. Now, uh, one of the ideas in the 20s, and the 20s was this amazing period um, of optimism, uh, was for a, uh, a multi-level structure with the highway and railroad combined and parks and offices and parking garages and all of that. And it gets simplified and simplified to the West Side improvement that we know today with uh, a high line, for the freight railway elevated above the streets and then uh, running closer to the Hudson River, an elevated highway uh, that was originally known as the Miller Highway, but we all call it the West Side Highway. So you can see between 1929 and 1934, uh, the railroad uh, fulfills it, its part of the bargain and uh, takes the uh, tracks off uh, 10th and 11th Avenue. Uh, and it runs from uh, St. John's Park, uh, which is where the Holland Tunnel is today, uh, Houston Street, uh, all the way north to uh, the 60th Street rail yards. And uh, uh, between uh, 1934 and 1937, uh, Riverside Drive is expanded by about 177 acres through landfill and in conjunction with the building of the Henry Hudson Parkway, uh, the four tracks of that freight line are, are put under the park largely. So we have a continuous freight uh, system on the west side of Manhattan and a continuous parkway uh, from uh, lower Manhattan to Riverdale. And uh, this is an interesting uh, photograph, I think, because it shows both the old and the new. We have the uh, 10th Avenue Cowboy, uh, was required by law, uh, the freight train, which was moving slowly, but still you can't stop a freight train, as they say. Uh, during the day, he would wave a red flag. At night, he would wave a red lantern to warn pedestrians not to go in front. And you can see the traffic backed up behind. And of course, you couldn't go from the east side to the west side. But if you look all the way behind, you see a double deck structure. That is the uh, High Line uh, moving from the 10th Avenue alignment to uh, the alignment between 10th and 11th Avenue. And the structure above it is a um, pedestrian bridge that was built to um, accommodate the new building that Nabisco built over the High Line. So the trains could actually load and unload those Oreo cookies and the ingredients directly into the uh, building without worrying about the weather. So you have the old 19th century technology in the foreground and the 20, 20th century technology uh, in the uh, background. And this is the first train to arrive uh, at its terminus uh, at Houston Street, St. John's Terminal. And you can see the press are there and they're tossing their straw boaters and uh, there's some uh, flash uh, photography going on. Uh, we have the uh, West Side Highway uh, designed by Walker and Gillette. Uh, it uh, was a uh, deliciously uh, ornamented Art Deco uh, arterial highway, the first elevated arterial highway in the city. Uh, and uh, anybody that re remembers driving it uh, recalls that uh, it is not up to modern standards. It was obsolete almost as soon as it was open. You can see these very sharp turns. This is the infamous S turn uh, right in front of the Sturette Lehigh building in, in, uh, uh, over Chelsea Park. Uh, to the right, we see the corner of Chelsea Piers. There wasn't a lot of right of way uh, to move around in. You have uh, a steel structure, which isn't as flexible as concrete, so uh, it's very right angles. And then you have these uh, ramps that are very steep that come up 
in the left hand lane, which you know is the uh, fast lane. And cars of the period are not automatics. They are, uh, you have to uh, standard automatic, uh, st standard transmission. And uh, you're frantically trying to, to put it into a gear to get up the ramp, which is rather slow. And then you have to go into a fast gear so you don't get swipes, uh, side swipe. Uh, it uh, was uh, white knuckle driving on this. And it was paved for some reason with uh, Belgian block, which proved to be very slippery uh, when wet. So uh, there were often uh, deadly accidents here, not beloved. But architectural historians love it for its detail. So if you weren't driving or stuck in traffic, you could enjoy the uh, uh, specially designed luminaires, uh, which look like little miniature Art Deco skyscrapers, and uh, these amazing, uh, almost Assyrian-like uh, ramp uh, entrances. And then there were these wonderful plaques that announced the cross streets. So by 1940, the West Side improvement was complete. So we are looking over the uh, New York Central's 30th Street Yards, where Hudson Yards would be today. We see the, uh, the spur of the uh, High Line that goes around the 30th Street Yards uh, to uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the area between uh, 10th and 11th Avenue. And uh, this spur, if you can see my cursor, goes to the post office. So that's how mail was brought into the city, to the general post office. And uh, this is going south. And here is our building completed. So our building really dominates uh, the neighborhood. And then the West Side Highway along the Hudson River alignment. Now, the wartime uh, was a period of great activity. Uh, men are shipping out. Uh, for the European theater. Uh, uh, men and women who are serving are coming home. Uh, goods are being shipped out. Uh, and goods are coming back and forth across the river. Uh, this is a very sad photograph on the left. This is the Normandy. The Normandy was one of the fastest liners in the French fleet, uh, passenger liners. And when France fell to the Nazis in 1940, it was rushed across the Atlantic, uh, just missing being confiscated by them because it could have been used against us. Um, it was uh, at the dock uh, at the Chelsea Piers, uh, being outfitted as a troop carrier, as were the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. Uh, again, brought here from England to keep it out of the clutches of the Nazis. Unfortunately, uh, an acetylene torch set a fire. And the most tragic thing is the police kept the naval architect who had designed the uh, boat from getting there because he could have uh, prevented this uh, catastrophe, but they couldn't understand his broken English. And he was some French guy just relating that. It's a sad story. Uh, after the war. Hey, John. Uh, Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, it's Liz. I just wanted to let you know in case um, you can't see the clock, we have about 10 minutes left. Okay, thank you. I know. It it's okay. all it's all great. I just I want to make sure we get to the Lehigh. Oh, no, of course. <laughs> Thank um, you. Of course. So uh, the the period after the war should have been very affluent, as it was for the most of the country, but not this area, because uh, things were changing. Uh, urban renewal, which had been planned before the war to deal with uh, deteriorating housing, uh, took place during this time. Three large scale projects. Elliott Houses was the first in 1947, a low-income project. Uh, Penn South, which you see here, the largest of the projects, the middle-income Mitchell-Lama Cooperative. And uh, the last one in 1965, the Fulton Houses, another low-income housing project. Um, and it made sense here, working class uh, rental housing for the workers working in the piers and in factories and places like Sturrett Lehigh. Uh, the International Lady Government Workers Union were the sponsors for their middle-income cooperatives uh, within walking distance of the government district to the north. What would change? Uh, some uh, critical technologies, containerization, which began here as an experiment in the Port of New York by the Port Authority in 1955, uh, became the dominant mode of uh, moving freight 
uh, by container ship. Uh, these piers on the Hudson River became obsolete. They were too small to handle the larger cargo ships that carried these uh, containers that could be lifted directly from the backs of tractor trailer trucks or flatbed rail cars directly onto uh, uh, container ships without a lot of uh, manpower, without a lot of handling. Uh, that makes things very efficient. That makes modern globalization possible because it brought the, brought the cost of shipping down. It also caused great uh, unemployment in the city and a loss of the tax base. And uh, the modern container ports that were built were built on the New Jersey side of the harbor uh, because of the superior highway and rail connections, because New Jersey is on the continental United States. Manhattan is an island. Brooklyn is the other part of the port, which is on Long Island. So it made sense uh, rationally, but it was a decision that would have uh, decades of economic, uh, cause decades of economic despair in the city. And we see this post uh, containerization uh, west side uh, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the Hudson River Piers, so proud uh, as late as the uh, 1960s, uh, are falling into the Hudson River. And uh, the West Side Highway, never a well-designed highway even when it opened, uh, increasingly obsolete as cars become faster and bigger. Uh, the city goes through a period of, of poor maintenance beginning in the 1960s. And uh, in 1973, uh, a uh, dump truck uh, loaded with about, uh, I don't know, tons of asphalt too heavy for uh, the deteriorating structure crashes through. And uh, you can see the results. So it's closed and there's debate for about uh, two decades almost about what to do. And uh, one of the projects, which was first proposed in 1970, 71, under a different name, becomes known as Westway. Uh, it would have um, created a modern interstate highway uh, in a tunnel under new landfill, uh, about uh, 900 acres of new landfill. And you can see the green areas would be public parks along the river, and the gray area would be the real estate that would uh, financially support it. Uh, you see a plan uh, on the right uh, by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. Uh, so it uh, had some really interesting uh, people, uh, talent, uh, star, architect, uh, star architect power behind it, uh, but um, environmental factors, the city's changing. Um, economics. Uh, this would have been one of the most expensive infrastructure programs in the city, in a city where almost every street was potholed, when the city subway system was constantly on the verge of collapse. It seemed foolhardy to build a four and a half mile uh, underground uh, park, uh, a highway, interstate highway. So the uh, two billion dollars that the federal government had promised us uh, were traded in, and over the next two decades, you saw the results in better maintenance uh, of the transit system and improvements uh, that we are enjoying today. As lousy as we think it is, it was much worse in the 1970s. So the neighborhood context in the 1970s and 80s was not good, but uh, you know, uh, nature abhors a vacuum, and so do cities. So when people abandon an area and don't invest, it provides opportunities for others. Artists, for instance, are, were attracted to the area because it was cheap. Uh, people on the margins of society that were not welcomed in, in the rest of the city found a place. Um, and uh, artists began noticing this and they chronicled this period for us. Uh, we have this legacy of film and uh, novels and photography. So here's some of the photography. Uh, Jonathan Weinberg's uh, book you see here. Uh, these are two photographers that extensively uh, chronicled this period. Leonard Fink in 1978 photo. And here you can see the Art Deco uh, sort of uh, behind the gentleman with the tank top. And uh, Peter Hayer, who is the lover of uh, David Wolschenholowitz, uh, which well, was Skevich, I should be able to pronounce that, right? Uh, 1976, this is one of my favorite photos of his. K 
capture this whole subculture that's developing on these abandoned piers. You know, it's easy to um, uh, romanticize this period, especially if you didn't live through it. Uh, these piers had a certain allure to them, a uh, very sexy, dangerous allure, but uh, a realistically dangerous one. Uh, you could be uh, murdered, you could be, uh, you could fall through the dilapidated piers, and if you were going down to these piers in secret, uh, nobody would know that you were gone, you know, for a while. Uh, the police would not go in. They were, didn't want to be bothered, too afraid, kind of passive aggressive. Um, more uh, of the same, uh, the cruising scene by the trucks and the tranny scene down by the meatpacking district that was uh, both uh, gay and straight because everyone loves trans before they became gen transgender people that we know and respect and love today. Um, ben Cuevas is a contemporary artist and what he's done is he's taken those photographs that you saw before of Leonard Fink and created a, a series called Ghost of the Trucks of the West Side Highway where with rental trucks, He's uh, blown up to life size the photographs and placed them in there, and you can walk between them. But they are printed on a scrim, so they're rather ghostly because there was another danger lurking here that we were not aware of in the late 70s. But by the mid 80s, we became aware of a, a virus, a pandemic predating our current pandemic, uh, the, uh, the AIDS uh, pandemic, the HIV pandemic. So uh, this has appeared both here in West Chelsea uh, as well as in West Hollywood. So now it get, brings us to the 80s and we see that by this time, uh, the Sturettes and Lehigh Valley Railroad out of it. Uh, Lehigh Valley Railroad goes bankrupt in the 1960s and uh, Helmsley Spear uh, takes up everything. Helmsley Spear was the McDonald's of real estate in mid century New York. They bought up distressed properties cheap, including the Empire State Building, and sat on them, did not invest, just sucked all the money out of them. Uh, and that's what happened to this building. Um, the people who uh, have long memories, who worked in this building at the time, can tell you some of the shenanigans that were going on. Uh, it's kind of uh, sexy, and it can seem glamorous if you're if you didn't live through that time, but it was a very dangerous uh, neighborhood. And uh, but you could get really cheap loft rents, commercial lofts. Uh, it was also a place since uh, it was not a place of middle class uh, propriety. Uh, you could have any kind of club, whether it was a nightclub with loud music uh, going through uh, 24 hours, um, uh, gay and straight, and uh, or as my favorite drag queen says, had a head of lettuce and everybody in between. Um, and what's interesting is how, what was very avant-garde and very edgy and very dangerous in the late 70s and the early 80s, by the mid 80s becomes mainstream as celebrities discover uh, these uh, uh, hidden places and uh, they're uh, written up and uh, become uh, tourist attractions. Um, the one on the right, the only one in color, is in the Terminal Markets building. Uh, it was called the, uh, the Tunnel, and it was this block long um, disco. The first real major physical change in the area begins in 1995, the Chelsea Pier Sports Complex, um, which takes the uh, abandoned uh, Chelsea Pier's luxury uh, ocean liner complex and uh, reimagines it as a sports, entertainment, uh, and movie and television production. So they're really hedging their best bet, bets. It's a mixed use project. And it's the first uh, example of a, of a place where New Yorkers could safely get to the water without risking their lives uh, or their, uh, their uh, bodily safety. The Hudson River Park uh, legislation is enacted in 1992 and construction begins a few years later and continues to the present. Uh, today, it's possible to hike or bike a 
the full 14 and a half miles of Manhattan Island along the west side, a dream of planners for decades finally achieved in our lifetime in the 2010s. And that brings us to the High Line. Um, the High Line was abandoned in 1980 as interstate trucking and in subsidized interstate highways uh, replaces rail freight, the flexibility of uh, trucking uh, an advantage over fixed rail. Uh, there were many plans to do something with this and it never got any traction until the late 90s when two uh, crazy guys meet at a uh, uh, neighborhood meeting um, and uh, they need uh, something to get people excited about uh, the Highland because they know it's magical when you go up there. And uh, luckily, New York is blessed with a lot of creative people who are also incredibly generous. So the photographer Joel uh, Sternfeld, for instance, pro bono took these amazing photos. And uh, Robert Hammond uh, said that uh, this is what they referred to as the money shot because this brought the money in, uh, the private dollars that got the uh, uh, officials interested in making this happen. Sorry. And here we see the context of our building, uh, the Sturette Lehigh building in the foreground, the terminal, mark, uh, terminal stores building in the foreground and a very lush abandoned high line. In 2008, uh, the area around, and this would be uh, Sturette Lehigh, uh, is uh, declared a, a uh, West Chelsea Historic District, so it's protected. And then we have the uh, zoning that we spoke of earlier. Here's uh, Robert Hammond, the gentleman with the glasses in the foreground. And behind him is uh, uh, Joshua David. And these are the two guys who had no experience running anything, uh, but they knew a little bit about um, public relations. And uh, in New York, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. Somebody knew Paula Shira of Pentagram, who designed the Highline logo pro bono. And people derided uh, Hammond and David as two guys with a logo. And then somebody knew somebody who knew somebody who knew Martha Stewart, who knew um, Diane von Furstenberg, who gave them $25 million. And uh, they were two guys with a logo and $25 million. And suddenly people were talking. And uh, beginning in 2006, we can see construction began to occur on the High Line. It was stripped down to its steel, uh, the tracks carefully numbered and stored, and a landscape replicated to look natural as if you had just wandered up there. And uh, here you can see it today. Um, the areas uh, attracted a number of uh, galleries that were being pushed out of Soho as rents were rising in the 1990s. And uh, we have uh, the uh, Google High Tech moving into the Port Authority building. And uh, here we have the neighborhood context as it is in 2020. So let's look at historic context. Uh, there are precedents for this building. Cass Gilbert uh, designed the R.C. Uh, Williams Warehouse. It's reinforced concrete, uh, but it isn't articulated in, a, in a, any way that is innovative. Uh, Cass Gilbert actually had been designing this building since the 1910s in his uh, Austin Nichols Warehouse in uh, Brooklyn, in, on, in Williamsburg, and in the Brooklyn Army Terminal in Sunset Park. Um, you can see it's been converted to a school. Uh, the Port Authority's inland terminal number one and only, uh, the Port Authority, which comes into being in 1921 to deal with the horrendous uh, tie up of traffic in the Port of New York, both uh, shipping uh, by sea and by rail and by road, uh, conceived of these inland terminals uh, where you'd have intermodals, trucking and rail, coming together in warehousing, like the Sturette Lehigh building. Uh, but this was the only one that was built, is now Google. 
the thing that makes the Stratton Lehigh building important historically, I'm going to borrow a phrase from architectural historian uh, uh, Haskell, uh, who said that, like the Empire, he said this of the Empire State Building, but I think it works for the Stratton Lehigh building. It's caught between masonry and glass. You know, if it had been built a few years before, like uh, Cass Gilbert's uh, reinforced concrete building, it would have been more mass. If it had been built a few years later, it would have been all airy, glassy volume. So you can see it's, a, it's an interesting transition building. You can see the transition in the building itself. There's the glass buildings of the period I'm talking about. The building itself has some really fascinating history too. And uh, I owe Liz, uh, a nod for this one. She uh, introduced me to this fact that Buckminster Fuller had his studio here. And here is the uh, uh, newspaper article that talks about Diego Rivera visiting him uh, in his rooftop studio. And this is the studio as it is today. And I put him in the studio. Uh, I find this fascinating because it's a very early post-industrial use. You know, something that seems very common today, we wouldn't bat an eye at it, but it must have seemed very odd, uh, probably maybe the only light on at night uh, after, you know, after the work day, he was at work on his uh, fantastic uh, projects. Now, let's talk a little bit about the people who put this project together. The architects, uh, Yasuo Matsui, uh, and he was the associate architect, and we have uh, Corey and Corey, brother architects. Uh, Yasu Masui uh, had worked with Ernest Flagg early in his career. Uh, two of his most uh, famous projects were the uh, Japan Pavilion, the 3940 Fair. Um, and this is a very sad thing, of course, because uh, the world was moving towards the Second World War. Uh, the war would occur in Europe, um, and uh, as Japanese and Americans were uh, bonding peacefully here in Flushing Meadows, uh, plans were being made in the Pacific uh, for uh, domination. And uh, uh, the day after Pearl Harbor, Yusura Matsusi, who had lived in America for many decades but was still a Japanese citizen, was arrested by the FBI and spent two months in a concentration camp on Ellis Island. And then for the rest of the war, he was allowed to work and allowed to go home, but he couldn't own a camera, which is hard for an architect. And he had to uh, report to a parole officer as if he were a criminal. He uh, became a naturalized citizen and lived until 1962. His uh, most famous building, his largest building is 40 Wall Street. Upon its completion in 1929, it was the world's tallest skyscraper, and today still marks the northern boundary of old Dutch New Amsterdam on Wall Street. Now, uh, he began to work with Corey and Corey on this project, which I like to call a dress rehearsal for Sturette Lehigh. It's the New York Dock Building of 1929, and it uses a similar structural system. Uh, it uses the same circulation, vertical circulation system. It has none of the experimentation that we'll see. And if you're wondering where it is, if you drive on the triple cantilever uh, BQE, you might see it going uh, northbound on the upper deck. Uh, from the air today, uh, it is part of uh, the Brooklyn Bridge Park. It has been rebranded as one Brooklyn Bridge Park, and it was the uh, first of the residential conversions in that a part of uh, Brooklyn's waterfront. The biggest project that Sturette and Eakins uh, were working on at the time that these other projects were going on was uh, the Empire State Building. They were the builders and the Empire State Building was famous not just for its height, but for the speed of its erection. And uh, the builders project uh, the builder's uh, um, program basically was to get this built as quickly as possible because remember it was conceived in the boom years of the 1920s and stock market crashes um, about the time that uh, construction is slated to stop, uh, start. And uh, they, they're, they're, you know, they have the money, they're borrowing the money 
uh, they're, they're paying for money that's not making any in income unless the building's finished. So the logistics of getting the steel and getting the limestone and getting the aluminum and getting all the things needed for a skyscraper there just when needed. Nothing can be stored on the site. There's no room. And uh, steel workers said that the steel was still warm from the mills in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. That's how quickly uh, the steel was coming to New York uh, by rail and barge and truck, and then hoisted up. Uh, everything that could be uh, pre-manufactured was prefabricated. Uh, they went on to build a number of housing projects, both uh, low-income public housing projects and middle-income projects, probably because of their ability to build things economically. And I use the word economically, not cheaply. This is building well, but, build, but building thoughtfully. Uh, Williamsburg Houses, probably one of the finest low-income housing projects built before World War II, uh, 1934. Hillside Houses in the North Bronx, uh, 1935. Uh, Parkchester, which was uh, privately sponsored by uh, Metropolitan Life. Uh, in the uh, Eastern Bronx, uh, probably the, the best planned one because it, Jane Jacobs says you could see would love it. It's a, ta it's a combination of Tower in the Park and the street, Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, uh, which she didn't love, and uh, Sturette City, which gave her apoplexy because uh, it was going to be the little brother of uh, Co-op City, but the sponsors went bankrupt, so Sturette uh, stepped in. They were the builders and the sponsors and it caused them to cease to exist too. Nothing good happened in the 70s. It was a bad time. Uh, Purdy and Henderson were the consulting engineers on this very, very complex project. They had a very long history in some of New York's most iconic buildings. The Waldorf Astoria, the world's largest hotel at the time, a flat iron building with its most unusual skyscraper. Uh, Imagine the engineering to keep that thin skyscraper, uh, not to not sway in the wind. The New York Times building in 1905, the tallest skyscraper in the city, followed by the Metropolitan Life Building, the tallest building in the world in 1908, uh, followed by Pennsylvania Station, a complex project that uh, combined long distance rail and commuter rail um, in a building designed by uh, uh, Charles McKim, uh, that uh, made one feel like they were entering a city like a Roman god, as has been said. And of course, the municipal building, a skyscraper built on top of a uh, subway terminal. So very, very complex engineering in all six. And we can't forget the partner, the Lehigh Valley Railroad, founded in the 1840s uh, by its... Uh, biggest period in the second half of the 19th century, stretched all the way from Lake Erie and Buffalo, all the way through Pennsylvania and New Jersey to a railhead uh, on the west side of the Hudson River and a car float over to their yards. Um, and uh, those were the yards that were leased 99 years uh, by the Sturette companies, hence the name Sturette Lehigh. So let's talk about some of the innovations. Look at this structure. Okay, I'm going to geek out. There's a lot going on here. Uh, first of all, the structure allows for the form that gets people so excited. The eight miles of continuous strip windows. Uh, it's not just sexy. It's not just avant-garde. It's very practical. Continuous ventilation, continuous illumination, no shadows. Look at that vast space. Look how deep it is. It's perfectly illuminated at all times of the day. Um, how is that possible? The columns are set eight feet back from the wall and you can see how the ceiling is beefed up. That's actually the structure, that's called flat plate. There's a lot of steel rebar in there and the steel rebar comes together in what's called the mushroom column. And that's how the loads are transferred from the floors above to the columns all the way down into bedrock. And uh, this was a patented process. It, it was uh, widely used, but really an advance over the typical reinforced concrete building of the period 
that often had uh, vertical columns and deep horizontal beams. Uh, this is more expensive, uh, but it gives you higher headroom and more light, more air, and more usable space for machinery. Now, the structure is really interesting. Uh, the structure changes because the uses change. It's a steel building supporting a reinforced concrete building. So the upper floors are reinforced concrete with amazing floor loads. And they're resting on this truss, a worn truss in the middle that transfers the loads to uh, two stories of steel. And the reason steel is used, steel can span long distances economically. Uh, and uh, you, you, the reason why it has to span these long spans is this is where the Lehigh Valley Railroad rail yards were now inside the building. So they could deliver in all kinds of weather. And thanks to Michelle, I have a shot of those worn trusses. This is the mezzanine between the concrete zone above and the steel zone below. Now, vertical transportation is really amazing. So on the surface, rail cars are uh, float across, floated across the Hudson and then roll right into the building. Trucks enter 27th Street down ramps and go directly into elevators where they're hoisted up to each floor. And you'll notice that they're hoisted up to a loading dock. So the floor of the factory is oh, about four and a half feet above the uh, surface that the truck drives on so that you can load and unload smoothly. It's a seamless movement of people and goods, both vertically and horizontally. An innovation, a vertical factory of the future. Every floor, first floor, they said, every floor is equally accessible as the first floor. It used to be that the higher floors were cheaper rents, no more. The higher floor is even more desirable because you have better views, better light, better air. And uh, here's an ad from the time period, which shows that rail yard on the surface, but also all the advantages of this building. Uh, I have the, uh, the number of panes. It's really fascinating. Uh, 110,000 individual panes of glass, eight miles. Now, I found everything from four miles to nine miles, and I looked uh, I did some research and the manufacturer who replaced all these windows to uh, landmark specifications. They did an amazing job because they look like they, the original 1931 uh, windows, but they are energy efficient thermal pane windows and uh, they say eight miles. So I'll go with them. Style. This is a very stylish building, but more importantly, it's one of the earliest examples in New York City of what would become to known as, be known as the international style, which you're all familiar with. Uh, this book by Henry Russell Hitchcock and Philip Johnson uh, was the companion to an exhibit held at the fairly new uh, Museum of Modern Art, uh, which had just been established in 1929. And they were not in their familiar building on 53rd Street, but rather in rented quarters in an office building, the Crown Building at 57th and 5th. So, uh, this is the sort of ad hoc exhibition space. And uh, here you see all of the greats of uh, the, the period, the, the pioneers of modernism, uh, Le Corbusier, uh, Nice, uh, and, and all, all the, uh, the, the founders, uh, Gropius, of course, uh, but very few Americans, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, there are two buildings in New York, I believe. Uh, and one is uh, the McGraw-Hill building by uh, Raymond Hood, and then our building, the Sturette Lehigh building. And uh, they uh, said that it fulfilled the ideas uh, of this sort of non-historically based, non-traditional, uh, functional driven architecture. As we've discussed, the facade changes because of the difference in uses and the difference in structure. Uh, although uh, many critics were disturbed by this vertical element, uh, they were actually being honest about the structure behind because this is reinforced concrete and this is steel and it's a different use. This is manufacturing 
and this was a ministry room. So this was basically an office building uh, merged into a um, manufacturing facility. So hence uh, the different uh, expressions on the facade. So it was true to the tenets of the international style. I love this illustration. It's even clearer in the illustration, uh, the simplified form. Uh, by you, Ferris, is that illustration. The uh, setbacks. The setbacks were a necessity because of the uh, 1916 zoning that you're all familiar with, which required uh, buildings to set back as they got taller according to formula based on the width of the street, a multiple of the width of the street. But here the setbacks are done rather artfully and not just because of the zoning, but uh, because of some subtraining conditions. Remember at the beginning, I spend a great deal of time on the uh, landfilling. Well, part of the site is uh, Manhattan Island where schist is fairly close to the surface and the ground is fairly stable. Uh, the Western portions, the portions closer to the Hudson River are 19th century landfill that was unstable. So in order to be economical and to not have a, a, as complex a, of a foundation, the tallest part of the building, the heaviest part of the building is placed uh, on the original Manhattan Island and the lightest part, the lowest part is on the uh, landfill. Uh, we're looking out of one of the windows of the, what was the administrative portion of the building. And these are called punched windows. These are the traditional windows that are punched into a wall. And it's looking out onto the strip windows, which uh, was uh, everybody uh, was in love with and was such an avant-garde idea at, on the Stratley High Building and earned it its place in the uh, international style exhibition. You can see the structure through the facade, another element of the international style. These uh, setbacks proved to be very useful as terraces, both originally and today. And uh, you'll find um, all sorts of activities there, uh, exercise, uh, parties, events, openings. There's, uh, there are gardens, there's gardening going on, there's actually food production, there's a beekeeping, there's a beekeeper. Uh, many people found the uh, allusion to traditional Art Deco architecture somewhat disturbing. Uh, but remember, this is a commercial project and unlike a lot of the projects that were commissioned uh, in the uh, MoMA show, uh, this had to attract uh, paying customers. So a little tradition right at the entrance uh, doesn't hurt. Uh, Carl Conduct considered the Strut Lehigh a highly innovative work that advanced the structural arts as much as to the techniques of urban circulation and also the major American work of column and slab framing due to its size and variety of its structural elements. The presence of wind ribbon windows in a multi-story building was enough of a novelty at the time Strut Lehigh was completed for the sober mammoth of pure utility to be regarded as avant-garde. Today, uh, as the building is being rebranded for 21st century post-industrial uses, uh, base design has picked this up in their branding of the building. You can see it's used in the building's logo uh, and on all media. Uh, the building also inspired two neighborhood architects uh, and they've said so in their uh, writings about their work, uh, Carrie Tamarkin was inspired both by the industrial sash fenestration as well as the double height spaces for this post-industrial residential building on 10th Avenue. And Annabella Seldorf was not only inspired, she said, by the fenestration, but the vertical circulation. So in this luxury apartment building has a luxury that no other building that I know of in New York has, where you can drive into the building, into the uh, building's uh, automobile elevator and into your own private garage. I'm not quite sure how that's luxurious. It sounds rather suburban to me. Do you uh, get out of your car and then walk past the washer and dryer into your kitchen? I don't know, but I don't drive, so. Uh, space, lost in space. 
how much space? 1,204, uh, 1,024, 124,000 square feet or 11,520 square meters. 1.8 million square feet of rentable space. That's the actual rentable space, not hallways, not elevators, not loading docks, not lobbies. Uh, uh, 1,673,000 square meters. Ceiling heights of 20 feet, 6.10 meters. And double height spaces are available as well. And uh, these double height spaces have these clear stories of monitors where you have daylight all day long, both north and south. Adaptive reuse. Now we're back in our time. And uh, this building is remarkable. Look at this, amazing. Truck uh, docks from the 20s uh, now uh, cafes and cafeterias, uh, break rooms, break areas, art exhibits, um, and all sorts of post-industrial uh, concerns. And I, I'm just going to go through these quickly because they, I, I have them because they show the versatility. It's all the same basic space, but every floor is completely different, uh, total flexibility. Now, uh, some of the changes that RxR, the current owners are making, are actually uh, very uh, um, urbanistic. Uh, for instance, uh, what would be a deserted area at night is being enlivened by retail and uh, cafes. And you can see what were once loading docks are now being glazed. Here we see the former rail yards in the process of being transformed into the retail expo food hall space. And these are some proposals. Uh, this is actually what I saw with Michelle and Liz as we walked through the building back in uh, January and February. Uh, they were beginning this work. And the idea is that this will be a flexible space, daytime use for office workers, nighttime work use, and for people in the neighborhood. It's all open to the public. Um, I have two quotes from a book that uh, features Stuart Lehigh, uh, the book of Vertical Urban Factory 2016 by Mina Rappaport, who's one of the uh, founders of uh, Docomomo US and a longtime board member and past president of uh, Docomomo New York Tri-State. And she said, we've pushed aside manufacturing in our cities. It has been usurped by high-end residential towers and Gold Coast real estate development. And as a result in New York, for example, you have sequestered manufacturing to very small districts. I am interested in investing this idea, uh, investigating this idea that by potentially, uh, by potentially manufacturing things locally, our cities can be more self-sufficient. We can save energy, we can save fuel cost, and we, uh, support well-paying jobs by making things closer to home. Boy, does that sound good in these trying times. Uh, this is an idea that we see happening all over New York City, all over the world. Uh, she goes further. We don't need a division between industrial and residential areas, which had been the paradigm in 20th century um, city planning. Uh, in vertical urban factory, manufacturing could be on ground floors and buildings with commercial and residential space above, or people could just make things at home, as we're doing now. She wrote this in 2016. So you can imagine a future uh, Stred Lehigh building or a building like it, uh, if the zoning can be changed and if the law can be changed, uh, to have residential on the upper floors. How wonderful would that be, but commercial and industrial below. So perhaps. Uh, this uh, 1934 uh, Bernice Abbott photograph is not the past, but the future. And this photograph of Hudson Yards, uh, this mixed use, but pretty um, uh, monoculture kind of uh, space is not the future, but the past. 
thanks. And thanks for your patience. I know I went over, so I appreciate that. Michelle, thank you. Liz, thank you. Thank you, John. That was great. Thanks, John. Yeah, we went over, but um, I think we kept everyone, um, all of the participants. So we were wrapped with um, your storytelling. So thank you. I know that there may be some questions or comments. And I'd appreciate them. Michelle, um, do you want to start with, um, uh, we do have some questions here, uh, which I can read. Um, so uh, the first question, John, is uh, what legislative efforts led to the demise of the West Side Piers as a space for sexual exp uh, exploration? Was it real estate development? Christopher Street was referred to in similar ways in the 1990s and the early 2000s. Were the piers spatially necessary due to homophobic, ho excuse me, homophobic discrimination in the 1970s? That's a really great question. So just as the piers developed in an unplanned way, as this I hate to use the word safe space because they were hardly safe. Someone asked me about, you know, do you have any experience? And I said, I was too young and too cautious. Um, but I've seen the documentary on them. Um, the, the, they developed for a variety of reasons, unplanned, and the same conditions, unplanned conditions, and there were many that came together to create the space the same way for their demise. So we have the uh, HIV epidemic uh, and the growing awareness uh, that this kind of anonymous uh, activity, sexual activity uh, was, was not healthy. And there was a lot of pushback. It's, you know, we're, it's the same thing with mask wearing in this pandemic. It's a political statement. Some people felt, you know, the seventies were about the sexual revolution and suddenly now we were being asked to uh, put a halt to the sexual revolution. So the negotiating of that um, is something. So there's that. Um, yes, there were real estate uh, people who were interested in it, but remember there were a series of downturns in the economy in the 70s and the 80s, and even in the 90s, uh, and then again in the you know, 2007, 2008. So it seems like every decade had, had there was a promise and then also Westway uh, was sort of like the sort of Damocles for 14 years. It, it seemed like it was gonna come any moment. So people didn't want to invest in properties. So that 14 years was a period of disinvestment and, 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 uh, and uh, decline, physical decline. But uh, those 14 years were also a time when the environmental movement gained and that what the, the court case that ultimately stopped Westway was based on the fact that uh, the, the, the rotting piers were actually a spawning ground, it's kind of ironic, spawning ground for uh, striped bass and that uh, the city government and state government had lied about it. Uh, so it was uh, basically uh, corruption uh, that, that uh, did it in and the court case was uh, ruled in favor. So that, that, uh, th those were some of the, the major reasons, economic, health, uh, changing attitudes. There's a, a great documentary called Sex in the 70s, which focuses on this and the, the cinematography is amazing. That's great. I know when I think of that neighborhood, I think of when I was younger in the, in the 80s, the 1980s, and, um, how colorful that neighborhood was um, and, and going to some of those dance clubs. Um, um, we have a few more questions. Um, the next one um, from Kathleen Randall, um, is the roof of the Lower West portion 
used as a roof deck? Is it usable space? It must have great views. Yes, uh, I uh, have some really great photos of uh, Lower Manhattan and uh, you can look up the Hudson River and towards Midtown and it has a great uh, Southern orientation. So it's warm even in the winter. Uh, Liz and Michelle, we were up there in January. It was a sunny midday and we had our coats off in the photographs. I took. Yep. And there, um, some of the people who work in the Star at Lehigh building tell stories about 9-11 um, um, and how um, when the towers fell and there was this exodus coming north um, that the, um, the police had blocked off the, um, the streets from turning east. So people were walking just north and I, I, 26th Street is what they say was the first street at which you could um, turn east and walk down um, into uh, Manhattan. And they, um, I think when we were told that story, we were standing on the roof and just talk, you can see all the way to lower Manhattan and what that must have looked like um, to see these people um, walking north away from the site. Michelle, is the, is the uh, that uh, western roof? That's where the beekeeping is, I believe. Is that correct? Yep. And they they would do a lot of events up there. Um, there's two sides. Um, certain tenants in the building had ac have access to the roof, twenty four seven. Um, and then some people, you need a key, but then every so often they would open it to the public for different programs. Um, they were really trying to use, you know, all the space they have, um, at, you know, to create amenities for the tenants there, which is really cool. <laughs> um, John, I actually have a quick question. Um, you know, I'm wondering what do you think, a lot of modern buildings, you know, had trouble getting um, recognized or being landmarked um, and Star at Lehigh was landmarked so early on in its life and sort of seemed to be recognized as significant. I'm just wondering kind of why do you think that was, um, you know, why was it different for this building? Um, it, that's a great question. It has a great pedigree. I think being one of the only one of two New York buildings included in that uh, groundbreaking show was one. Two, it's so big. <laughs> it's iconic. Uh, three, uh, poverty was uh, uh, positive in the effect that it wasn't modernized, it wasn't changed. Uh, a lot of buildings that are closer to the core, their um, uh, historic elements were changed with the styles. Uh, we've all seen Art Deco buildings that were international stylized, and we've all seen international style buildings that have been postmodernized, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this one avoided that. So I think all those three things helped it. Thanks, John. Um, one last question. Um, you mentioned uh, Helmsley Spear as the McDonald's of real estate of the 1980s. Aside from the contemporary desire for open loft spaces, what could uh, be some of the architectural legacies of their firm in New York City? Uh, well, uh, they, they were, um, they weren't, they didn't design space. They, they were real estate owners. So Harry, that's Harry Helmsley and Leona Helmsley. And no one ever heard of Harry Helmsley outside the real estate business until he dumped his longtime wife, his Quaker wife, and married his uh, secretary, Leona Roberts from Brooklyn. Uh, she knew how to uh, wield a steno pad, apparently. And um, you know, he becomes part of the social scene. And you know, and you know, we all know the story of Leona Helmsley. Uh, the the she shed a light on a side of, of the Helmsley operation that helped Harry was able to keep quiet by his low profile all those decades before. So uh, Marquis 
uh, properties like Sturt Lehigh and like the Empire State Building, ironically, they both they own both, uh, were really run down in the 1970s and 80s. I mean, it was embarrassing as a visitor to come to New York and you bought your tickets in a basement. And when I say basement of the Empire State Building, it literally was a concrete block, dropped ceiling, cold fluorescent lit, bare concrete floor basement, painted canary yellow and it was and, and really dirty and gross. Yeah, Harry Holmesley, thank you. That's how Leona could afford all of her doodads. Well, New York has definitely turned uh, turned around from the 70s and 80s. Um, and, you know, there'll be uh, a next life for Star at Lehigh um, once we uh, come through the pandemic. Um, I know Michelle and I have been in the building a couple of times um, since it's been closed, but the building is actually reopened. I know people are working in there. There's a lot of construction, um, but it's an absolutely beautiful building inside and out. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for doing all this research um, and sharing it with everyone. We hope that this will continue to live on and, and people will um, just really continue to love and appreciate that building. Thank you, Liz. I would just want to add a thank you to uh, Liz and Michelle. It was a great being part of the team because the researching was uh, the team effort. And one last thing, if there's any building that uh, will survive in this pandemic, it's Stir at Lehigh with continuous ventilation, natural ventilation, natural light, and you couldn't get more social distancing than in that building. It's so uh, terrific. So true, so true. We love sitting in there with the windows wide open. Um, you know, if the heat was on too high or whatever was going on, it's just a great connection to the outdoors. Yeah. Well, thanks uh, everyone for sticking with us. I think we um, uh, we went a little a smidge over, but uh, it was a wonderful program. Thanks again, John. Thanks, Michelle. And um, hopefully we can do this again. Thank you, bye. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thanks, John. Good night. Good night.